I asked Krista to sing that because it was in the midst of 8,300 people, mostly high school age folks, worshiping phenomenally that the sermon came to me. Um, I had been reading and I, I kind of knew the direction I wanted to go in and um, when Hillsong did this song, it just, I knew right then. And uh, if, you, if you missed it, uh, the four groups that were there were, were all just terrific. And um, four and a half hours of pure worship. Surprised any of us have no strength or to lift our arms. And <laughs> but our, our row was definitely the geriatric row. <laughs> with all the excitement of March Madness behind us, and I guess if you're a UNC fan, a little disappointment there too, but it's uh, all behind us now, and we're moving right into the next season, but as the uh, March Madness ended, I, I was reminded of a story that I heard once about a girls basketball team, and it's a small town. They had never had a girls' basketball team in the high school before. <clears throat> and this uh, new teacher came in, and uh, she had grown up playing basketball, and she asked about a, a girls' team, and uh, so they allowed her to form this girls' team. And she was a young, exciting coach, and uh, she pulled together people who had never played together. And uh, the first year, well, it was all right, but by the second year, had sort of found their groove, and she would put them through their drills, and she coached with all of her heart, and these girls just literally fell in love with her, and they played their hearts out because of it. And so the second year, they uh, won their conference championship and went on to the state tournament, and they ended up winning the state tournament. These girls who had only played together for two years of this coach won the state tournament. And at the end of the tournament play on the ride home on the bus, the uh, coach gave them words of encouragement and praise, and then she told them that her husband had been transferred in his job to another city, and that would be the last game that she would be able to coach. Well, as you can imagine, the team was devastated. These girls looked up to her. They, they, she was their mentor. She was their confidant. She was their coach. And they had put all their efforts in playing for her. Well, the next year rolled around, and they brought in a new coach because, you know, you can't have a state championship team one year and then no team the next. So they brought another coach in, and the coach tried to follow in the footsteps of her predecessor, and the team was ranked high in the preseason polls, but without their old coach, the team fell apart. They didn't play as a team. They were playing individually and not with any heart. And so the one-time champions ended up falling to the bottom of their division in their league. And at the end of the season, the new coach left because she was as disappointed in them as they were in her. And so talks began and discussions were held whether or not to even pursue a girls basketball team any longer. And so they decided they would give it one more year and see what happened. And so they brought in another coach, and this coach 
once again brought the girls through their drills and coached them. And it looked like it was going to be a similar year to the previous year, that they just weren't playing with heart, they weren't playing as a team. And in the midst of one game, one by one, the girls looked up in the stands, and there was their old coach sitting there. And she was cheering them on, and she was shouting encouragement to them. And they pulled it together. And they started playing as a team. And they won that game. And they won the next game. And the next game. And they ended up having a winning season. Simply because they knew they had not been forgotten by the one that loved them. The gospel lesson this morning comes from the 21st chapter of John. Sometimes called the epilogue. And there are some scholars out there that will tell you that the 21st chapter of John was not written by John at all, that it was written later and added, it was not a part of the original manuscript, that John actually ended where we ended last Sunday. I don't think that's very important. I don't care who wrote it or when it was added. I still find it to be incredibly inspired. And the message in the 21st chapter comes through loud and clear. Throughout the entire story of Jesus that John tells in his gospel account, there are, very, there are two very specific and important elements that run from the very beginning when he writes, in the beginning was the Word, all the way through to Jesus and Peter sitting on the beach. And those two elements of, that John writes about are abundance and grace. In the very first chapter of John, I think it's John 1.16, John tells us that from the abundance of God's grace, we have all received one blessing after another. And that while Moses brought the law, Jesus brought God's grace and truth. And then on the 10th chapter, John famously quotes Jesus when he's gathered with his disciples. And Jesus tells them, I didn't come just to bring you life. I came to bring you abundant life. I didn't come to just give you something mediocre. I came to bring you the best that heaven has to offer. So with those thoughts in our minds, grace and abundance, let's look at our lesson for today from John 21. We'll read the first 19 verses. I invite you now to hear the word of God. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and the two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of a large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it's the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, only about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. 
So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. And Jesus said to them, Come, have some breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? For they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. And he did the same with the fish. Now this was the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him a third time. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and they will lead you to where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then Jesus said to Peter, follow me. This ends the reading of our gospel lesson for today. This is the word of God, and it can be trusted. Thanks be to God. Did anyone else catch the themes of abundance and grace in those 19 verses? I think for me, it is so vividly illustrated by a net containing 153 fish. You notice the writer didn't say, well, it was about 40 or 50. He didn't say it might have been about 200. He said it was 153 fish. Now that's a strangely odd number to know how many fish are in the net. Now I'm not a fisherman. I don't have the patience for it. But I do come from a very long line of fishermen. My grandfather was an avid fisherman. My dad, my brother, my uncle, all of them loved to fish. My dad's famous saying was, a day on the lake catching nothing is better than a day at work doing anything. <laughs> My dad loved to fish. I'm not a fisherman, but having grown up around so many fishermen, I know that if you have a cooler on your boat with a couple of bass, a couple of brim, and some crappies in it, that is a good day on the lake. To lift up a net with 153 fish in it is phenomenal. That is abundance. Now these are guys, seven of them, that could not even lift that net into the boat. Now these were seven guys, some of them professional fishermen, knowing what they were doing, they could not get this net in the boat. Now think also... They have been out all night long. They have been fishing all night long, over and over again, casting nets and pulling them in. Cast the net with, with nothing. Absolutely nothing. Professional fishermen who know where the good spots are on the Sea of Galilee, nothing. A stranger from the shore waves and says, Hey guys, have any night? Have any fish? You know, like the guy following from one boat to the next. Have any luck today? And they said, no, didn't catch a thing. He says, throw your net out on the right side of the boat. And what do they do? They do it and pull it up. And there's so many fish, they can't even get into the boat. Seven guys could not haul a net of fish into the boat. Now that's abundance. Later, when they realize who it is, and they get on the beach with Jesus, 
And they come in, and he's really got breakfast. He's got fish on the grill. He's got some bread. And he says, sit down. Let's have some, some breakfast. Let's eat. And it says that they're eating breakfast. And when they were finished eating, not when their snack time was over, it says when they were finished eating, meaning when everybody was full, when the meal was over, when everybody was satisfied, another example of abundance. And once everyone was satisfied, Jesus said, Peter, come take a walk. And so they walk off down the beach, and in my mind, they have a seat, and have this conversation. They needed some alone time, Jesus and Peter. And Peter had been in the upper room when Jesus miraculously appeared the other week. When he appeared to all the other disciples, Peter was there. He had seen Jesus. And then a week later, they go get Thomas, and Thomas is in the upper room with them. Peter was there then. He saw Jesus then. This probably wasn't the right time to have this conversation. Peter had been blessed, commissioned, had the Holy Spirit breathed into him, and after all of that, he had returned to what he was comfortable with. Which he didn't immediately run out and start preaching the gospel. He wasn't out evangelizing. He went back to fishing. I mean, he's seen Jesus two times already. And Jesus has not only said, go and preach. And here's the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on him and gives him the Holy Spirit. He gives them purpose. He gives them direction. And what does Peter do? He does that for fish. But before we're too hard on him, the other guy said, yeah, we'll go with you. We'll go with you. I'd rather go fishing than go knocking on doors. Who knows? Who might be killed? Some of them. Maybe he was filled with guilt over his denial of the relationship he had with Jesus. Christ. Maybe he felt inadequate to carry on as a, as a disciple. We don't know what was really running through Peter's mind at the time. I tell you what we do know. We all know what has run through our minds when we felt like Peter. We know what we felt like when we denied Christ. We know what it feels like to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We know what it feels like when we have to come back and get on our knees because we've done something that we shouldn't have done. So we understand feelings of guilt as if the church hasn't put enough guilt on us. We know what it's like to feel guilty. We know what it's like to feel inadequate. There's no one in this room that has ever escaped feeling guilty. No one here has not experienced feelings of inadequacy. No one here has ever not been unsure of what to do or felt unqualified or been embarrassed. So what do we do? We slip back into our old comfortable routines. We slip right back into what we were all comfortable doing. It's like that comfortable pair of jeans and the sweatshirt that you put on when you get home. Because you just want to be comfortable. Like Peter in the kingdom of God, grace and love are abundant. They're actually part of the force in the kingdom of God. But you know what? Just like Peter, Jesus is going to give us either. He's not going to leave us alone until we answer that call to discipleship that we've been given. He's going to continue following us because he loves us. And he's going to say, do you love me? Do you love me? 
today's lesson is just a remarkable illustration of how faithful Jesus is to each and every one of us who, in and through our lives, have not always been faithful to Him. And I'm the chief sinner. I can tell you that right now. I'm not proud of it, but I can own it. It's a great example of how God's grace is at work in the lives of His beloved. You know, Scripture is not just about what happened 2,000 years ago. It's about what's happening right now, right here, right here in this very room, right here in this very city, right here in this very state. And all you had to do was be at the the Bon Secours Wellness Center Thursday night to know that God is alive and well and working in this town. We are Peter, and Peter is us. I can easily imagine the feelings that Peter must have had that morning when Jesus sat him down and looked him in the eye because I've been there myself. Like Peter, each and every one of us is given a renewed chance to follow even when we run from the truth. And like Peter, we've all had our moments of denial. It may not have been as blatant and as obvious as Peter's, but there's been a lot of times in our lives when we said, I don't know the man. And if we didn't say it in our words, our actions did. Like Peter, we ran from God's abundant grace. When God was standing here doing this, we were so busy running the other way that we couldn't see it. And he relentlessly pursues us. So he didn't love me. Concert the other night. Phil Song did one of the newer songs called Relentless. And I just kept watching the words as they flashed on the screen and it just, it just struck me to the core. Because the song opens by saying, Salvation sounds a new beginning. Salvation sounds a new beginning. Salvation sounds a new beginning. We are on the track with Jesus Christ at the moment of our salvation. But then, words keep going, and the song ends up saying, Redemption's bid is unrelenting. And God's love carries our love. Redemption is unrelenting. I don't care what we've done, where we've been, how bad we think we've been. Salvation did open the door. And Jesus follows us relentlessly. Say, my love is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Come home. Even in times when we lose our way, God's grace will carry us because it is relentless. He is relentless in coming after us. And if we love Jesus, then his ministry becomes our ministry. And what is that? He said, he told Peter, feed and follow. Jesus' path becomes our path. And he says, take up your cross daily. Follow me. Forsaking all others, take up your cross and follow The lesson today tells us what's required of those of us who are on this side of the cross. The same things that Peter was given to do as he sat with Jesus on that rocky shore of the Sea of Galilee apply to us today. As disciples of the risen Savior, we are given two things to do within our community. The first is to help lead people into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. 
We call that evangelism. And I tell you the way the political scene has hijacked that word I hate using it. But it is what it is. We are still, no matter what the political system has done with the word, we are still called to evangelize, and that is to introduce people to the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. We let the Holy Spirit do its work in their hearts. We're just simply called to be messengers of the good news through our words or our actions. And then we're called to shepherd people. In our communities of faith, we are called to embrace each other as brothers and sisters of the risen Savior as brothers and sisters and heirs to heaven, we are to encourage and love each other. While each of our accomplishments can vary based on the gifts that the Holy Spirit bestows upon us, each of our gifts will lead us in the same direction, and that is evangelism and shepherd. True discipleship is seen but we become the hands and the feet of Jesus. Not because we have to, but because we are motivated by our love for Him. I know growing up on Thursday nights, we were required, we had to, go door to door and hand out tracts. Oh, I wish I could take that back. Because they were horrible. As I said in Sunday school this morning, that those churches, spent so much time trying to scare people out of hell. They forgot to teach people how to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's these horrible pictures in the, you know, if you die tonight, do you know where you're going? Thomas McAfee, I think. <laughs> I don't want to be scared into a relationship. I want to enter into it fully on my own, knowing that it's out of love. And once we come into that relationship with Jesus Christ, we can't forsake the same You know, you hear people say all the time, well, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. I don't really need to go to church. We do need to church. That's what Jesus set up to be the community of faith to support us in the times when we need to come out of this. We live on the other side of the cross as believers and disciples of Jesus. And so we're called to feed sheep, tend the lamb. Father Jesus. Even in moments of uncertainty and doubt, we are called to place our trust in the one who offers us abundance and grace as we move forward. For the sake of our beloved, the ones that we Christians say that we love, right here on this side of the cross, Let us pray that the Spirit will lead us to places where our trust is without borders. For that same Spirit will take us beyond where